afternoon. It's so nice to have all of you here. My name is Lindsay Winters Jewell. I am a program manager at Echo Idaho. So, welcome to Echo Idaho's Alzheimer's Disease and Related Dementia series. Um, if you need any tech help today, our staff, Hong Yen, you can give us a wave. She's here to help. Uh, you could just private chat her and she can give you some tech help. Um, she also will be placing a link so that you can claim your CMEs. Look for that code and link in the chat later on in the session. Um, if you have any questions or comments, we're a nice sized group. You can always unmute and ask those directly or you can use our chat to put those questions and comments there. So I have a couple brief announcements and then we'll get started. Um, so the first announcement, we're looking for help from all of you, from primary care providers um, who can help us better understand the current state of geriatric care in Idaho and help inform future ECHO series. Uh, so there will be a link to a uh, survey that Hong Yen is putting in the chat. Then the second announcement I had, um, in May, we have within ECHO Idaho's behavioral health um, for primary care series, we have two upcoming sessions that may be of interest um, they're related to traumatic brain injury. And so to find out about those two sessions scheduled for May, look for more information in the chat. And then the third announcement um, on May 9th, there's a powerful tools for caregivers workshop in Boise and a link to that can be found in the chat as well. So today our schedule of events, uh, we're going to start with a knowledge burst um, presented by Susan Melchiori, um, our panelist, and she'll introduce herself shortly. Um, the title for the, uh, the topic today is Brain Health Across the Lifespan, Strategies for Risk Reduction. So thanks so much, Sue, for presenting that knowledge burst. And then following that conversation, we'll have a patient case presentation provided by Amanda Holcomb. She is an LMSW at Syringa Hospital. So thanks so much, Amanda. Uh, let's do some brief waving and turn your camera, cameras on and give us a wave hello. Um, if you are a doctor, we'd love to see you wave hi. Thank you so much. How about PAs, NPs, and nurses? Wonderful, thanks, Judy. Um, do we have any pharmacists joining us today? Dane, we may have some others there, thanks. And behavioral health providers? Thanks, good to see you, Keisha, thanks so much. Um, how about others that may not fit into one of those boxes? Thanks, good to see you, Amanda, Jim, thanks. Um, who's joining from North Idaho? Woot woot, um, how about Southeast Idaho? And who do we have from Southwest Idaho? Thanks, and if you're joining from outside of the state, we're happy to have you here as well. Oh, South Central, thank you <laughs> for the call up. Um, let's do our introduction of our panelists. We're going to go in this order. Reiko, Dane, Oni, Sue, and John. Um, typically we have Richard Howard. He is a caregiver, but he is absent today. So Reiko, Dane, Oni, Sue, and John, please. Hi, hi everyone. My name is Reiko Emptman. I'm a geriatric psychiatrist at the Boise VA. Hello, my name is Dane Castor. I'm a clinical pharmacist at the Boise VA. Uh, I cover primarily the community living center, uh, which is made up of uh, hospice palliative care, long-term care, uh, rehab, and skilled patients. So more of an inpatient setting. Uh, over to you, Oni. Excellent. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Oni Pinberg. I'm the director of social work here at the Boise Veterans Home. And in a couple of months, I'll be <clears throat> celebrating my 20th anniversary of the same commute to work. So going on 20 years as a state employee here at the Veterans Home. Um, oversee the department, but my specialty is dementia care and we have a very nice uh, dementia care unit. Um, so happy to be here and happy to hear the case study. Looks very interesting. Uh, Rerick. Hi, I'm Sue Melchiori, a geriatrician up in North Idaho at the North Idaho Memory Clinic. And also the Idaho State Veterans Home in Post Falls that just opened, Woohoo. Uh, my name is John Wolf. I'm a neuropsychologist. I'm three doors down from where Dr. Melfiore is right now, uh, working with the North Idaho Memory Clinic. I also have 
another individual in the room, this Don Kincaid, one of our clinicians. So. Here we go. Uh, thank you so much. So, Sue, I'm going to pull up your slides and you can just let me know when to progress. Okay, sure. Yeah, I'm really happy to be here today. And hopefully this is a, a useful uh, subject for all of us. It's one near and dear to my heart because I am very excited about the idea of brain health across the whole lifespan. And we're going to talk today about risk strategies or strategies to reduce risk of dementia. So we can go to the first slide in reviewing some of the learning objectives for today. We're gonna to be talking about modifiable and non-modifiable risk factors and trying to really understand the impact of various lifestyle changes on brain health wherever we're at in our lifespan. And we wanna also consider how the impact of social determinants of health can play a role and recognize that this is a lifelong process. So we can go to the next slide. Thomas Edison, way back in the day, said that the doctor of the future will give no medication, but will interest his patients in the care of the human frame, diet, and the cause and prevention of disease. I think that was really forward thinking for back then. And maybe we ought to be looking more at prevention of more seriously on diseases, especially those that we don't have a cure for yet. Is dementia preventable? And the next slide shows that over really observational studies in the last couple of decades have shown us that in high income countries, the proportion of older people with dementia is actually decreasing. In fact, in the United States, for those over the age of 70, dementia proportion has decreased from 13% of the population in 2011 down to 10% in 2019. If you look at this another way, they've studied this out by percentages the percent of older adults with dementia is decreasing by one to two and a half percent per year. And truly that's amazing, but still the total number of people with dementia is still rising. And that's because our population is aging, right? The baby boomers are coming of age and we're looking at a proportion here where the denominator is greatly increasing still. So our estimates of people living with dementia is great. We're at 7 million now in the next 20 years, expected to almost double. And the next slide, to understand why this is happening, it's important to conceptualize that the changes in the brain that lead to dementia actually start decades before we see the clinical symptoms. So this is just a schematic, it's not precise in any way, but clearly gives you the idea that whatever's going on in the brain starts way upstream. So to look at prevention, we wanna consider this time ahead of the clinical symptoms. And the next slide shows really where we believe there's a complex interaction between multiple shared mechanisms as shown on this aging tree. And I love this tree. It's not that you could see all the details right here or that we're gonna go through it in a lot of detail, but just to show the complexity. And this is actually from the uh, Journal of American College of Cardiology, and they were looking at vascular risk factors, but it parallels risk factors for dementia very closely, as the studies show. And there are multiple pathways to the development of dementia. Some are modifiable, but some are not. So the next slide, we're just going to touch briefly on the non-modifiable risk factors for dementia. So as we look in the mirror, you know, what can and what can't we change? Our age, age is, of course, we all know the greatest non-modifiable risk factor for dementia. And then, of course, we need to look at our genetics and family history that we can't change. And there's a number of polygenic factors that we're not going to get into today, but are vastly growing in the research departments. And then gender and race ethnicity. I wanted to show some data on the next slide from a study in 2016 that looked at the prevalence of dementia based on race and other factors. The top three rows are what we want to look at here. And it's clearly showing a difference between Black, African Americans, Hispanic, and whites in dementia and mild cognitive impairment prevalence. It's just important to take those into consideration. The last two rows deal with one of the modifiable risk factors. So we're going to talk about those next. 
And the next slide shows how we will be focusing more on these today. Most of the evidence for modifiable risk factors comes from population-based epidemiologic or even observational data. And this certainly is very robust data, but not randomized controlled trials, right? The randomized controlled da trial data is very hard to get at because these have to be very long studies and large numbers of people trying to control multiple factors. Um, and the data on randomized control trials is very encouraging, but not totally conclusive. So I believe that has slowed the rollout or the adoption of this idea of modifying risk factors for dementia. However, given the scope of the problem of dementia, if we could reduce um, even by a little, the effect and impact could be huge. So the Alzheimer's Association and other organizations lately have taken up the, this is a public health campaign to reduce risk factors for dementia. Depending on who you read, they list seven to 12 major risk factors. And if we could reduce these risk factors, we could prevent or postpone the onset of dementia in 30 to 40% of cases. I mean, imagine that, that, that is globe changing. Um, another study looked just in the United States, if we could reduce some of these risk factors by 10 to 15%, Every decade between now and 2050, we could prevent 1.2 million cases of Alzheimer's disease in the US alone. The benefits to starting these risk factor modifications early in life are clearly there. So starting young is important, but research shows that intervention at any age is helpful. So what I'd like to do is to go to the next slide, which talks about this impact. So if we could impact, the World Health Organization in 2017 declared that dementia was a major cause of disability and dependency worldwide. At least 8% of the world's population is affected by dementia. And I might um, argue how they define affected because we all know it's not just the person living with the disease, it's their family and their caregivers as well. So this percent might be much higher. They also declared that it was the number one non-communicable disease that causes the most years of life to be lived with a disability. The cost, of course, is astronomical. It's estimated that over 800 billion, with a B, dollars a year are spent annually annually on the cost of dementia. Most of these costs, ironically, are not medical care, but are family and social care costs. So the scope of the problem is huge. If we could prevent even a small portion, the impact, right, could be huge. So the next slide outlines 12 modifiable risk factors. And this comes from the 2020 report of the Lancet Commission. And they looked at 12 points of intervention that impact either one or both of two physiologic pathways leading to dementia. These pathways are in the green boxes, kind of in the center column. Either number one, reducing damage to the brain, or number two, building cognitive reserve. And cognitive reserve is defined, of course, as the mind's resiliency or agility, kind of the, the brain's ability to cope with stressors or challenges. So I'm just gonna run down this list briefly and then we'll talk about them in more detail. But uh, the top left box, uh, you can see this was printed by a United Kingdom English language with minimize spelled with an S. So we want to minimize diabetes, treating hypertension, preventing head injuries, stopping smoking, reducing air pollution and reducing midlife, that's midlife obesity especially. Those six factors we believe will reduce the neuropathologic damage, right? Reduce the buildup of the amyloid or tau mediated plaques and tangles, reducing the vascular risks and inflammatory risks around the brain. The bottom three, treating hearing impairment, maintaining those social contacts and a higher level of education, those of course build cognitive reserve. And then the middle three risks, we're looking at frequent physical exercise, reducing depression and avoiding excess alcohol, those feed into both pathways. 
factors, right? So it, it helps, at least helps my mind to understand how do these risk factors actually fit into the pathophysiology of, of preventing dementia. So the next slide gives us kind of a fun schematic that the Lancet people put together, this life course model of modifiable risk factors. Now, you don't have to read all of the detail on this slide because we're going to blow it up in the next two slides. But just to give you this idea that they start at early life at the top and they do a reverse S figure going down to late life. And what they've done is applied the intervention along the lifespan curve at points of greatest impact to prevent dementia. So if we go on to the next slide, the other thing they calculated was the percent reduction in dementia prevalence if this risk factor is eliminated. So for example, less education is one of the huge risk factors for early life. And if we could reduce less education or let's say promote education, we could reduce the percentage of dementia prevalence by 7%. That, that's huge. And that's one of the bigger impact points is education. And by education here, they do mean formal education. So this is school education, university or college education, anything that is a systematic, sequential acquiring of knowledge or skill. That includes adult learning, adult education, college classes. And certainly this feature is associated with social determinants of health, right? Education, access to good education and lifelong education. If we move down the list, uh, hearing loss is the next one they talk about. And there's a lot of data on this and it's, it's very impactful. You can see they have 8% reduction in dementia prevalence if we could eliminate hearing loss, which of course is a big pill to swallow, but very impactful. There's a lot of study coming out around this. One of the more interesting studies to me was where they looked at folks with midlife hearing loss and followed their volumetric MRI scans showing that the temporal lobe volume was actually reduced in these people as they tracked over time. But the good news here is that if we use hearing aids and we use them well, that it actually is protective. So here's a great take home point. If we diagnose hearing loss early, if we intervene, if we use hearing aids well, fit them, reduce the stigma, reduce the cost. If we can apply hearing amplification, that is actually protective, so very important. Traumatic brain injury is the next risk factor that we'll touch on. And let's think of seatbelts, helmets, um, fall prevention. We want to definitely reduce any traumatic brain injury and especially in early or midlife. Um, the, this is associated with various forms of dementia and certainly will reduce cognitive decline and prevent dementias. Hypertension, another big category. The definition of hypertension here is midlife hypertension with a systolic blood pressure of greater than 130. And we're not doing so well on this. 40% of our population has a midlife blood pressure of greater than 130. So again, big impact could be made if we attack this risk factor. The next listed risk is alcohol use, and this is excessive alcohol use, right? So there's quite a bit of controversy over this because some studies are suggesting perhaps a protective effect for dementia with a little bit of alcohol, um, but clearly everyone agrees excess alcohol, more than two drinks per day for males and sometimes more than one or two for females, depending on size, that is excessive in this realm. So we want to be careful on that. Obesity, another risk factor that we're not doing so well with, again, 39% of our population having obesity risks. The next slide goes on to later in life. And I think um, it's interesting that they tucked smoking in here because probably quitting smoking at any age is a good idea. But here they're looking at um, a 5% reduction in uh, dementia prevalence if we quit smoking. And many of the studies show that if we a smoker quits, within four years, their dementia risk is reduced back to that of a non-smoker. So really great success 
to quit. Depression has a very complicated association with dementia, right? We know there's an interrelationship between these two diagnoses. The old terminology of pseudo-dementia, right, being depression is, is still valid. We see cognitive change with folks that are depressed and that can improve as it gets treated. Also, dementia patients can become depressed or develop secondary depression and treating that can be very helpful in reducing future dementia risk. Social isolation, we've seen the effects of that through COVID and how important it is to stay socially engaged. Mm -hmm. Physical activity, right? That is the new smoking is sedentary lifestyle. So we need to get moving, we need to keep moving. And I'm gonna have some data on that in just a minute as well from a newer study. Air pollution was one of the later risk factors identified with the Lancet group. And we still don't know yet what is the threshold amount of air pollution that we are exposed to or the duration of air pollution, but more data, more research is being done on that, but beware of that as a risk factor. And then diabetes. And initially, this is the, di the, the diabetes prevention. So it is important to prevent diabetes, which very much is impacted by our nutrition, our nutrition knowledge, and our access to food. So again, social determinants of care coming into dementia prevention. There was a recent study that just came out earlier this month looking at people who already were diabetic and controlling their A1C the risk of dementia was less in people who had a lower A1C. So it may also be very useful to treat well the diabetes, but certainly diabetes prevention is a risk factor from this group. And then our next slide is just to remind us, I want to look at a few things more recent. The Lancet was in 2020, their latest report, and there's a few articles, you can go to the next slide few studies I just wanted to point out. This was a large prospective cohort that came out last month, um, over 60,000 participants for more than nine years, and they looked at the risks and benefits of a Mediterranean diet, and truly a higher adherence to the Mediterranean diet was associated with lower dementia risks, and this was independent of their genetic risks. So even in a group that had risk factors genetically for dementia, they did better with the Mediterranean diet. You may have heard of the MIND diet, M-I-N-D, which is sort of a combination of the DASH hypertension diet and the Mediterranean diet, also probably being equally as good and, and a fun mnemonic to teach people. The next slide shows us another UK biobank study, huge study. This came out in the Neurology Journal last July, looking at uh, physical activity and social activity, mm -hmm. following these folks for over 10 years, and truly a higher level of adherence to rigorous, vigorous activity and housework-related activity. Now, I really totally believe this was a typo in the article, but somehow housework got into this uh, exercise pattern. But apparently, hey, it's vigorous activity. And these folks had a lower risk of dementia, as well as the people that had visits from family or friend. So again, important to look at the combination. A later study looked at the best activity might be social dancing, which is why this picture is here to remind me that dancing with somebody may be a really good brain activity. The next slide talks about a, a, another large prospective cohort study that came out last month looking over 10 years, but this time a combination of these risk factors. So not just diet or exercise and social contact, but they looked at cognitive activity and not smoking or drinking. And folks that had more of these favorable lifestyles, they had less risk of memory decline. And that was irrespective of their APOE4 or genetic risks as well. So really important to adopt some of these lifestyle factors regardless of our other risk factors. The next slide is just the last little study I wanted to point out, which um, because it's lunchtime and we're all thinking about chocolate and cocoa and our vitamin intake, uh, this was a randomized control trial that looked at over three years, over 2000 people, 
and they did not see any effect on global cognition for cocoa, sorry to say, but the multiple vitamin supplement actually did have a significant benefit on global cognition as well as memory and executive function, especially for folks with cardiovascular disease. And I, I really just point this out because I've had a few patients actually come in to me and say, hey, doc, I've seen these ads on TV or these ads in the journals and magazines, and they're saying vitamins are good for my brain. Should I still take my vitamin? Well, I think the, mar the marketers have seen this research study. So I believe that's where this is partly coming from. And maybe there is a reason more study needs to be done, but this is one positive effect that I've seen from that uh, data. So in summary, the next slide, really, we want to keep in mind that the pathology of dementia starts way upstream before the symptom onset. And if we could modify some of these, even a few of these risk factors, we could postpone or prevent up to 40% of dementias, which could have a huge global society impact. So we really want to look at shifting our mindset to prevention, start with a younger population, especially if you're in primary care or access to school age people. We also want to insert these lifestyle interventions at any age. So wear your helmet, eat your spinach, learn to foxtrot and tell all your friends. Thank you. Sarah, thank you so much. It's inspiring and you're a wonderful presenter. Um, let's open it up to any questions. You can unmute and ask or put those into the chat. Uh, this is Steve Monomat. Um, you know, I think we've seen the association between education and risk of dementia. Has anybody teased that out more to, I think you mentioned that, yeah, it affects social determinants. Uh, you know, what are the downstream effects that maybe uh, could be addressed uh, if we're not successful with educating more people? Ooh, if we're not successful, yikes, that's a, that's a grim picture. I think, you know, if we can certainly promote the organized, the formal education is what I've seen in the literature. So learning anything systematically and continued lifelong learning, right, probably the best brain exercise, so to speak, is learning something new, a new language, a, a new song to play, a new song to sing, anything, a new recipe, learning some new skill is really important as a brain activity. Um, I don't know that I've seen long-term data on what happens if we don't do this other than we could have, you know, we're going to continue to have the dementias that we have. But it definitely starts upstream and trying to get folks to realize the importance of this early in life and getting it out to the school systems. They have seen a few initiatives looking at that and also through the library systems. I don't know if anyone else has seen that. I'd be happy to hear. Well, I think those are good thoughts. I think, you know, not everybody uh, needs to go to college, right? I mean, there's trades, but I like the idea of lifelong learning. I think everybody can buy into that probably. That, that's why we're all here today. <laughs> Good call out. Um, so we have another question from Judy in the chat. She's asking about sleep. Yes, thank you for mentioning that. Um, sleep is huge and it, you know, funny, funny, it wasn't brought up in this Lancet Commission and some of the other formal groups that have looked at observational studies, but good sleep is hugely important. And I think in the next Lancet and World Health Organization reviews, that's got to be included. Um, I can't deny that as being critical. We've all seen the sleep apnea people that have some depression, hypertension, it's just mounting their risk factors for dementia, right? And also poor sleep patterns. Um, huge topic, and I agree that's very, very important. Uh, Amanda, do you mind unmuting? You can ask your question directly. I knew you were gonna say that. <laughs> Hi. Um, so one of the slides mentioned, but it seems like it wasn't um, in maybe the, the Lancet information about cognitive challenge. And 
um, I've heard that a lot, like you want to maintain cognitive challenge. I wasn't sure if it wasn't listed as one of the preventable, you know, factors because cognitive challenge is hard to quantify or to, you know, what that means to one person. They'll say, oh, I do my crosswords, but somebody else, it's like, well, you're not, you know, learning a new language, like that's a cognitive challenge. So I did see it listed on one of your slides, but it wasn't really listed elsewhere as a form of preventing dementia. Do you see it often? Yeah, I, I think it's rolled into the education piece. Yeah. Um, right, because that continuing to learn something, a new skill, trade, hobby that fits with cognitive challenge. And I've seen some later data, you know, on the online programs. I won't mention the names, but there's some brand name online brain train games. Mm -hmm. um, and they're not really any better than, you know, picking up and doing a, a hobby on your own. So, I think most of most important, it has to be something that we're going to continue to do. It interests us. It's something we're not seeing as a chore. It doesn't add stress to our life, but it's an enjoyable learning is what I've seen in the data. I, I also saw that the because um, I've heard as well that prevention is, you know, reducing stress, which is also really hard to quantify. Was that is that something that you see a lot like people that have chronic stress or maybe a period of super acute stress in their life that they're more likely to have dementia or is that not necessarily the case? That would probably be anecdotal on my part, but I'm, I'm sure um, um, Dr. Entman might have an idea there, but I do think that's critical and relates to depression and mm -hmm. social isolation, which some yeah. stress rolls into. If anyone else has a comment on that, it's huge. Thank you. You know, there's some interesting data on um, a negative age-related stereotypes and an increased incidence of anxiety and depression. People who have beliefs that aging is a bad thing and that um, older adults can't contribute in a positive way to society tend to experience depression and anxiety at much higher rates later in life, which could be related, hard to say. I mean, I'm just thinking about some of the risk factors that came up in that Lancet study. It seems like they kind of did that independent of etiology, but it seems like some of them clearly seem more vascularly targeted. Others may be more enrichment, like maybe Alzheimer's disease targeted, but it seems like people have both or could potentially have both. I just sort of wonder if, if, if we're thinking about it as practitioners to think about, well, what else do they have going on medically? And, and, you know, it's like if they have like high blood pressure and they're not taking their medicine or they're not exercising, it just seems like we could think about the preventive or even the enrichment stuff kind of tailored a little bit to the likely etiology. I don't know if there's research on that. It seems like they kind of lumped a lot of that together in that study. That's more of a comment than a question. Yeah, no, I think you're right. And a lot of it was observational data. So they were pooling a lot of observational data from various um, different kinds of dementia. Yeah. The other question I get asked a lot is, I don't drink, but I've read that drinking is good for my brain. Should I start? <laughs> so, so I'd have to say no, <laughs> although that's you know quantifiable. Some people believe it is helpful. But there actually was a study that just came out early April, huge study in the United States, looking at alcohol risk, all, all mortality, all cause mortality for alcohol. And there was no protective effect of alcohol for all cause mortality. For me, that's good enough to say, don't start if you're not, but you know, <laughs> yeah. Well, thanks for listening. Wonderful, thank you. If you have any other questions that come up, um, you can put that in the chat and our team can get to those questions as well.